Now, uh, let's turn to Dr. Ignacio Sofias, Advocacy Talent Acquisition in, in uh, International Federation for Family Development, and his session on participation of older persons and active healthy aging. Dr. Sofias, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Eric, and I will make sure that I don't speak more than I'm supposed to, because with age, this is a risk, <laughs> to be sincere. Well, thanks very much for your very comprehensive presentation on the World Social Summit, which is really um, very good to understand why we are here and what is the importance of, of what we are doing. Um, I am also very thankful to all the authorities who spoke at the introductory session of today because uh, they helped us to understand something that for me, after all these years, is very clear. The r important role of families in social development. That is why also, as you will very well understand, we decided to focus this event on the possible main contributions we can make to the summit. The summit, as we already know very well, uh, was the follow-up, it's going to be the follow-up of the Copenhagen summit, focused on eradicating poverty, decent work for all, and intergenerational solidarity. What else has to be introduced into the topics of the new meeting? As Dr. Bihasi was saying, we, the, 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 the summit will have two parts. The first part is to review what has happened with the Copenhagen Declaration Plan of Action, and the second one is to see what new topics should be included in the discussion of social development for the following years. Our proposal for this are the three topics that will be considered in the workshop. Integration of youth, which is a real problem nowadays in many countries, integration of migrants, which is also a great problem. And the third one, which I'm going to talk about, integration of older persons. In fact, the Copenhagen Declaration already foresaw something about this. It said, in all countries, people, may be particularly vulnerable to social exclusion, poverty, and marginalization. So older persons, especially. We need to think in a future where older persons will be respected as they deserve. I know this affects me personally, <laughs> but it does, I'm going to speak about. And why is this so necessary? Because we have two factors that have completely changed the landscape of societies since 1995. The first is the growth of aging population. And the second, the more life expectancy. Just have a look at this. In 2015, 
the number of people over 60 were 12.3% of the global population. In 2050, they will be 21.5%. How do we know it? Because we, we, we know it because people, those people are already here. Maybe most of you will be there. And also we know that fertility has been going down and this is not going to change in the following years. So we are going to have a society in which the number of old people will nearly double. If you want to know in which countries this will happen more, you can see now countries and territories with the highest share of people aged 65 in 2024. Number one is Japan, number two is Italy, number three is Finland, number four is Puerto Rico, Portugal, Greece, Germany, and Croatia. But in 2050, we can see a clear shift to Asian countries, uh, not only Japan, but also Hong Kong and South Korea, where the fertility rate is the lowest in the world at present, 0.7 children per woman, and then also some European countries as Italy, Spain, Greece, and Portugal. So um, you can also see in this following graphic how the population of countries is going to change and how those countries will be the countries with more young people. Countries like India, China, Nigeria, the US, Pakistan, Indonesia, Brazil, Democratic Republic of Congo, Ethiopia, and Bangladesh. I wanted to mention this because you can see that in many of those countries, New individuals, people who are born, won't get the, both, the, the, the best possible education or the best possible health. So in, we can say that humanity in the years to come will be older, less educated, and less healthy, less healthy, okay? And this is why I want to say the integration of all the people will be so important. Now, let's go a bit quickly through the different areas of the world. You know that Asia is now the part of the world with more population. Now it's 64%. And that's why probably the, 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 the concentration of all the people, as we said, will be great, greater in that continent. Europe, at the same time, has the highest proportion of older persons relative to its total population. In Europe now, around 20% of people is already over 65. So this we were seeing for the whole world in 2050 is nearly a reality now in Europe. Also, North America is experiencing a significant aging, and they will get this 25% by 2030, uh, but even Latin America and the Caribbean is aging rapidly, and that remains uh, as with Africa, where, as I was saying, improvements in health are 
contributing to increase the older population, but not enough, because they don't get, as you well know, the educational level they need, nor the health level they need. So if, if we go now to this uh, second factor, life expectancy, we can see that North America and Europe will get the highest one, together with Australia. But then we get Asia, Latin America, and the Caribbean, and Africa. What I want to point out is that in the future, we will have two worlds. One world, which is younger, less educated, less healthy, and another world which can be educated and healthier, but older. What, what are the drivers for this? What, what, what will help to, to, to make this a reality? We have already talked about the declining fertility rate, increased life expectancy, and also, this is the third factor I want to introduce here, migration. I think this graphic is really incredible, but it's true. I mean, from the 1960s until today, the fertility rate in the world is less than half of it was. So it was uh, basically 5.20 something, and now it's 2.5. Probably by now, because these are dates of 2021, probably by now it's 2.3. What does that mean? Nobody knows really, because it's, it's an, I mean, this significant, persistent trend to low fertility, lower fertility every year has never happened before. Uh, but what we can say is that it is not going to, it's not going to revert at least in the following years. We have organized at IFFD different uh, expert group meetings during um, the past year for the 30th anniversary of the International Year of the Family in the five continent. And the one in Asia, we had it in Kuala Lumpur. We had a very good demographer from uh, South Korea who was telling us that the situation of fertility, not only in South Korea, especially in South Korea, but in the rest of the world, is like the perfect storm. And he speaks about 23 different causes for it. We were talking about this in New York in the final meeting, and a, and a demographer from Germany said, well, I can, I can, I can quote 47 if you want. So this means that uh, we need to count on this, and this is the main driver. Second, life expectancy, we have talked about it. And third, migration flows. Mm -hmm. You can see there in a pale blue color, in migration countries, and in a more yellowish color, Immigration country. This will completely change, and it's already changing in many places. We were discussing yesterday about this. What is the best solution for migration? And of course, there is not one fits all solution because every country has different circumstances. But the truth is that as much as a country gets older as much as much as young workforce it will need. But this young force will come, we will have to come from some places. 
uh, this can be regulated in many ways, but it's not so, it's not so easy. In any case, as migration is going to be the topic of another talk, I'm not going to get into it much, but just wanted to mention it. This has a lot of economic and social implications, like for instance, we were mentioning it, the, the, the sinking workforce, which means that public pension systems and healthcare services will be strained for sure. Then the this significant adjustments in healthcare will affect delivery and financing because there will be less money to finance them. And third, social implications we already see as isolation, ageism. So one first very clear idea is that we need to ensure that older adults can remain first active, second engaged, and three supported. This is a bit of humor now, but I think it's a very deep consideration. When you are turning from a younger society to an older society, uh, you need to keep in mind what this shows. People who are young usually are um, in very good conditions uh, on Fridays. <laughs> and then the weekend comes and they tend to spend all their efforts. Well, all the people usually uh, use the weekend to recover. Okay. You can talk about this for the whole week, but you can also talk about this for the for a day. You can also talk about this for a work perspective. So all the people probably have are able of less physical effort, but they have more experience. They are able of less uh, innovation, but more consolidation, etc., etc. So this is something that should be kept in mind. I, I use this bit funny thing, but it's, it's, it's like this in many, many ways. Also, uh, I think this is interesting, what is called the five pillars of healthy aging. So policies at work, etc., should try also to focus on this because for young people they, they don't need to be encouraged to do physical activity uh, they can't be convinced of doing a healthy diet they they will have quality sleep even if they have to sleep on the floor okay uh, they they have brain stimulation we we we, we learned that, for instance, a young kid makes 1.4 million neuronal connections every second. I don't know how many <laughs> neuronal connections can and older people make, but I don't want to know it. So, and also relationships and purpose, connection with others, stay engaged, find the purpose of the future. So these are things to keep in mind in an aging society. Also, if we want to consider aging society, an active aging, you need to think about making it healthy, making it uh, relationship purposeful, uh, making it healthy through biogerontology, try to make, uh, to combat, to eradicate ageism, uh, promote social protection, inclusion and social participation, and therefore mental capacity and mental health. 
We are talking about two different concepts. That's true. Healthy aging and active aging. They are not the same because health usually comes from two factors. Okay. Your, your DNA, one can say, and uh, your past, what you have done in the past. But active is something you can do today. I mean, older people, if they feel useful, they can do sometimes much more than they actually do. So, after this, what are the challenges that political systems and legislation have to face regarding all older people in the future? First, something politicians don't like to talk about, but they need to face pensions, systems, adjustments. It is true that it's not a problem for tomorrow, tomorrow 4th of September. Okay? Not probably for the next year, but it's every time near the moment in which welfare states, as they are thought today, won't be able to face the future as they do now. Second, the transformation of healthcare systems, especially everything that has to do with geriatric care, care delivery, prevention, and this is not only for older people, because we know now, for instance, what the effects of smoking have been. Smoking in, of course, in statistical terms. Maybe one person smokes all his life, and he stays healthy. But for that one person, that will be 85 who will. So we now know what the consequences of a smoking are. And we need to tell people, because if not, we will have, some countries do now more than others, a real healthy problem. We can also talk about alcohol, we can talk about many things. But in any case, we need to prevent more. Then for labor markets, what will happen, yeah, with, with very easy to mention here, uh, artificial intelligence, AI, okay, AI. What's, what's going to, to happen with that? We don't know. But we, we learn every day. Uh, also, there is a lot to be said, and I will at the end, about retirement age. Because we are in a society where labor market has two main uh, real uh, difficulties. The first is that it's thought just for men, not for women. But the second one is that it expels people out when they are in the best situation in his life. Because, I don't know, 30 years ago, someone who was 65, was old. Now someone who is 65 can still work for many years. As always, talking on a statistical terms. Okay. When a professor was telling me, "Are you retiring?" I can't believe it. But you're, you. yeah. But I am the age to, to retire. I mean, I will do many things probably. But you see, so there's this this adjustment, and then. Balancing the needs of other, older adults with those of younger people in taxation, in social services. Intergenerational solidarity is very important. Because when there is this interaction, everyone gets benefited from it. When there is no interaction, everyone gets you know, the, 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 
the consequences of it, and the consequences are not positive. And then technological innovation, uh, telemedicine, robotics, etc. And yeah, and probably, I mean, maybe you don't remember this, but when um, IT started to be present in our lives, everyone was saying, well, with computers, uh, our life will change completely. And it's true, it has changed completely on the surface. Okay? Now, for instance, people from all over the world can see what I'm saying. This is a change. Now, most of you are with your computers or are tired of my, and are into your phones, uh, trying to, to see what you can find there. And that a change. But at the end, we are all the same person doing the same things and trying to find to 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 yeah to reach the same goals one way or another but that affects the surface that doesn't affect the future so talking about intergenerational solidarity what i wanted to say is that we have to acknowledge that there is a new generation that has emerged in societies is emerging every time more. First, we have the kids, the parents, and the grandparents who were trying their best. You know, they, they were really old and somehow handicapped for life. Now, grandparents can be very active and they can do a lot of things. If you see, for instance, that picture, you have here one kid with his parents, but grandparents are not all people who need to be in a hospital or in a residence or who, who need to be taken care of. So if we don't take advantage of these people who are probably the best equipped to help us with the future and even to help younger people, then we are missing a great opportunity. Then why, why have we worked so much in health improvement, in life expectancy improvement, in preventive uh, health? If we have it, and that's a great conquer of humanity, we need to take advantage of it. So my, my, my last part would be now suggesting recommendations. If you're going to contribute to an advocacy plan, you are supposed to include their uh, some recommendations so that they can be incorporated to future documents uh, at the UN and in all countries' legislation. I don't have nine recommendations. In fact, I have 25. But they can be all structured in these nine points. I will try to... to to show you what I mean. For instance, making long-term care systems stronger will mean, first, investing more in professional in-home nursing, in rehabilitation services and assistance. Second, in creating developing centers that offer daycare, social activities, and respite services. Very important is because usually, I said, there is a new generation. But then after this new generation, it comes the real old people. These old people need to be cared. And who's going to take care of them? If it's not the family, things get very complicated. And those family members need also to get some respite, to get some, uh, some time for them. 
so that they don't get burned out. Third, improving the quality standards in care facilities by protocols, inspections, and staff training. Number two, promoting age-friendly environments. What does that mean? It means that there are public spaces, public transportation, housing, that is really accessible, safe, and comfortable for all the people. For instance, if you look at benches in parks, you see two types of them. One that are thought for people who nearly need to rest so that they can go to a park or to walk, but from time to time they will need to sit down and rest. And others which are just artistic creations. Very nice, very innovative, but very uncomfortable for people to sit on them. They shouldn't be thought for the 15 years old. I mean, the, those don't need to, to, to sit there. I mean, they have to be thought for the 85, 90 year old. This is just an example. Same with public transportation, for instance. And, and with, with the whole of common space in society. Three, enhancing healthcare for older adults. Healthcare models that combine medical, mental health, and social services. We have learned, especially after the pandemic, to, to care more about mental health. And mental health of older people is also as, in, as important as the mental health of younger people. Uh, most of the times, all people who feel isolated, alone, they they wouldn't probably they probably they wouldn't probably have someone to tell it. But they need to have a way to show it and to get help. Ensuring coordinated care plans tailored to the individual, increasing the number of healthcare providers trained in geriatrics, for instance. Then also, as I was saying, supporting caregivers, number four. By, first, by providing financial assistance, tax breaks, subsidies. I always say, as some of you know, that when someone is helping society to solve a problem, they need economic, professional, and social recognition, these three types of it. Then training programs to equip caregivers with the skills needed to effectively care. And then also, as I was saying, prevent burnout and ensure sustained quality care. Five, enhancing social inclusion and participation. Older people need to feel that they can give something to the rest of society. Uh, because if not, they will close to themselves and they will end up doing nothing. Then also promoting digital literacy. I think this is, uh, how can I say this? We have been saying for years, okay, Young people are digital natives. They know a lot about technology. And older people, they don't know. That can be radically false. Because, OK, maybe all people don't use the last video games console. Or they don't know, uh, I don't know, how to close a window or how to but when they are given the chance, they can use very, very well technology. Among other things, because being I mean, people who have been uh, digital natives are now getting old. And you see, okay, you were, you were, uh, okay, you were 50, and when did you start using a computer? When I was 15. So it's a question of, of time. 
Uh, and providing access, uh, SDG number four, providing access to uh, education. I mean, all those programs in universities, for instance, for older people, help a lot of people to catch up with things that they couldn't do in their past. Six, strengthening legal and policy frameworks. All these things about laws against elder abuse, neglect, and discrimination. Uh, I know that in my country, many older people are living their inheritance to some immigrant that has taken care of them in the last five years or 10. What does that mean? That probably before they were neglected or they were abused. So providing also them with access to legal assistance and promoting age-friendly employment policies. Then raising public awareness, organizing public campaigns, uh, challenge stereotypes. We like, I mean, in this topic and in many others, we like stereotypes a lot. And we need to recognize, and this is, I think, the, one of the best consequences of globalization, that when we make general affirmations, we're not being really fair. It is true that statistics, as I was saying before, mark a trend. But then, within those statistics, there are very different people with very different things. Uh, eight, developing sustainable funding models, public-private partnerships to fund and manage programs for older adults, social impact bonds, private investment for public projects aimed at improving care for older adults. And then, finally, fostering global and national collaboration. It is very good to share good practices. We do this with our cities project all the time. Something that works in one city, for instance, one example I've mentioned several times, having a building in which you have uh, daycare for kids in the basement, then in the first, second and third floor, uh, houses or apartments for old people and in the rest of the building apartments for students who won't have to pay a rent if they take some time to care about the older people living below them so this is just one example there are many that can be shared and then developing and implementing comprehensive strategies that address needs of older adults so I think with all this, we can conclude that population aging being a defining demographic trend of the 21st century has profound implications for economies, healthcare systems, and societies worldwide. And as the proportion of older adults continues to grow, it is imperative that governments, the private sector, social communities adapt to ensure that older individuals can lead a healthy, productive, and fulfilling life. And therefore, preparing for this real demographic shift will require coordinated efforts across multiple sectors with innovative solutions and a commitment to real intergenerational. If you have any questions, I'm open to them. Thank you. Dr. Ignacio. Dr. Ignacio. Dr. Ignacio Sosias, uh, thank you very much. Uh, it was great exemplification, visualization that leads to some 
very important realization, uh, especially about uh, the distinction between the certain continents. I would like uh, to ask, uh, first of all, before questions uh, from the audience, uh, our panelists, uh, if you have uh, um, any thoughts on this uh, distinction and uh, how to minimize uh, the uh, disproportions between Africa, United States and Europe, especially I have in my mind the Africa, because as we've seen, the uh, age estimated for 2050 is around uh, 60, I believe, uh, almost 60. Yeah. So, comparing to Europe, more than 80, it's such a large distinction. What are your thoughts about the proposition of investments? Rule of, rules of law that could be implemented first. Uh, I, I would like to give the floor to uh, Dr. Uh, Jose Alexandro Vasquez. Well, that is a topic that we touched upon with Ignacio, and I would like to hear from the ones that are going to prepare the advocacy plans tomorrow and after tomorrow, especially on the connotations of older persons, but also related to migration and young people. What are the, all the interlinkages that are going to be changing with all those groups? My thought is, what was also expressed by the European Union to, 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 to deal with the migration from Africa to, 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 to Europe, it's so important, you know, to don't forget Africa. Concentrate what deal can be done in Africa to support uh, societies locally to foster their change there to, to make that people will want to stay there, to stay, to recruit and to develop. That, that that issue and as I remember one of the one of the European Union deals with this goal and I fully agree with that uh, it helps to form the sustainable de social development in that area. Thank you very much for these crucial uh, comments in relation to Dr. Ignacio Susia's uh, excellent, magnificent lecture. Um, and uh, could we pass on uh, the mic to uh, the audience because we have some questions. So, uh... yes, uh, Ignacio, uh, pot provoking speech. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, uh, I wouldn't agree with the retiring. I would name it your retiring. I would name it shifting to other activities. <laughs> yeah, so uh, uh, I think that's a very uh, good speech about IFFD, the importance of IFFD, uh, what we do and what is uh, the important for the world. Appreciation once again to Dr. Sothias uh, for this presentation and for all the work done in the international advocacy work at the United Nations, the European Union and other global institutions for many years. Please uh, let's give a round of applause for Ignacio. And, yes. and uh, now we can move to the questions from the audience. Uh, Yes. So I will pass the microphone to the lady first. I have a question. Um, how big of a role does immigration play in a society that is aging? 
Well, there's a very evident rule. If you need young workforce, it has to come from someplace. And if it doesn't come for the same society you're talking about, it will need to come from outside. And that is what we call migration. Now, how you regulate that, that, that is the real point of it. As we're going to have, uh, I think, uh, as, uh, a plan about migration this afternoon. Maybe we should leave it for there, but I can say for now that we can't, mm, we can't say we are totally against migration because we need it, as well as we can't say we're, we're totally in favor of everyone coming from wherever. So this needs to be very well studied and calculated. And we have already, uh, as uh, Dr. Isot was saying, from the European Union, a lot of experiences. We, we, we can see how many mistakes. I will just talk about my country, Dr. Michelin. Uh, for instance, I think in Spain, we should have taken advantage once we need people, young people, to prioritize the access of South American people to our country. Why? Because they talk our language, they have our culture. So for them, it's much more, it's much easier to integrate. And that is the key word, integration. Thank you. Hello. My question is about the uh, map you're showing, about the net immigration and emigration. There wasn't the information for which year it was data. My question is for which year it was and how do we expect to change the immigration process in the future? That's a very good question because you are right. Things in our world, maybe it has happened always, but we can say in our world, things change very quickly. So sometimes you, you see a picture of the social situation you think it will stay there, and it doesn't. We can think, for instance, of what has happened in Germany very recently, or in other countries. So, yes, I, I agree that we need to have more, more research, more accurate information, keeping in mind the goal is the one we were saying, integration, social integration. And if I can say that, because I'm not going to talk about migration later, we have always advocated for the right to family unification. But not just because we are, so to say, but because reality says, evidence says, that when someone who migrates can bring his or her own family, to the new country, they will integrate much easier. So that can be maybe one of the And the second question. There was a one slide with projection population in different countries. And Democratic Republic of Congo, there is a projection that over 100% of population will grow by 2050. So what's the idea behind it? What's the changing that we expect so much growth? Well, uh, if we talk about Africa, as, as Franek was mentioning before, the point is Africa has a social situation in which, which is completely different to other countries, in which 
increasing fertility is a condition for their survival. And that's why, I mean, there are small countries, and that's why they are not there, but countries like Nigeria or the Republic of Congo are growing very, very quickly. In fact, Nigeria is supposed to overpass the United States in population in, in some years. So, mm, and it's, I mean, how, how can we help them? I think we can help them through education. So everything, every, every dollar or every euro or every slot, if you want, invested in education in Africa, I think it goes in the right direction. Of course, a lot should be made, but I think, but, but, but let's start doing something because we need people who are well educated and therefore can make responsible decisions, etc. It is not true, I think, that people who come to Europe from Africa are the worst ones. No, they are usually the best ones. Because they are the ones who think they can thrive and come to Europe. And that is a difference from other historical flows, migration flows. So maybe the, the question is how can we help them to, to get what they really need? This is easier said than done, for, of course, but I think it, it shows a possible way. Thank you. Uh, taking the opportunity that the microphone is nearby, I also would like to ask a question. Uh, Martin Kluschel, I'm from the Ministry of Development, Funds and Regional Policy. Uh, I'm also very much interested about uh, demography, uh, fertility rate, uh, and so my question is uh, uh, connected to this issue. Uh, Mr. Sosias, uh, uh, what do you think about uh, the right policies to support uh, fertility rate? Um, do you see that uh, the material benefits and, for example, access to services uh, is uh, more important or rather we have to think about cultural issues, so promoting families, promoting you know, the, the culture of, of being or of living in a family. Uh, what of these uh, elements are uh, more important uh, taking account your experience? Thank you. The more honest reply I can give, I think, is that it's very difficult to tell because all the so-called family policies that have been implemented up to now, mostly in European countries, haven't worked in the mid and long term. So some work on the short term, for instance, Sweden, they got this uh, great uh, maternal leave. First was 18 months, they, they, and it helped to increase the fertility, but then it has gone down again. And I think it has to do a lot with, um, how do I say, something I say, it's very simple, but I say usually, which is that, Family policies, policies, social policies in general, they are like remedies, like pills. So when you give a pill to someone, it's not easy to evaluate the results, to see what the right dose, etc. Obviously, the, the first thing that should be said, in my opinion, is that subsidies don't work. Because subsidies help people for today, but not for tomorrow. Uh, cash transfers and so on, they can help for a little bit. But you are totally right, I think that's what you're saying. What can really change the things is not only culture and education, but also the social environment. And that is a difficult point. Because I mean, I don't know, when I was young, a couple could get married with, and, and 
survive perfectly well with one salary. Now two salaries are needed. And uh, houses are not as cheap as they used to be. And so I mean all that social, all this perfect storm I was saying before. I think it so I think this is the this would really deserve a whole social summit and a real study to see how all this can be changed for better. Because there is one thing that gives hope, and it is that people want to have children. I mean, when you ask in, uh, you, yes, people would like to have more children than they do. But the problem is they have to wait a lot, and then when they, when they feel they are prepared, maybe it's too late, or maybe they never feel they are prepared, I don't know, she, she has been raising her hand for a while. Thanks, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to ask one question about uh, this active aging. Uh, is there a possibility to actually introduce after retirement age um, kind of working conditions for uh, older people and if they are willing to actually work and uh, engage in this a kind of um, new vision of uh, how uh, the retirement age can actually uh, look like uh, to change the normal uh, and uh, introduce something new and if uh, there are some uh, programs actually happening now or uh, what has to be done to actually uh, facilitate this change and um, make these working conditions as uh, Mm, as much uh, favorable as they can be. Yeah, thank you. Yes, very good question. It's not only possible, it's real. There are several experiences in different countries now. But as time is over, I will, I will tell you, maybe we can talk about this later, okay? If you want, I will be more than happy to, to, to tell you. But this is more than possible. Thank you. Do we have more questions? Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this uh, enriching discussion.